Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. My name is Peter McKee. I run the developer relations team here at Docker. And today we're going to be talking about getting started with Docker. Okay, so let me share, let's jump right into it. Make sure everybody can see my screen. Okay, excellent. So today, what we're going to be doing is running through uh, the getting started tutorial that we have in our Docker desktop. Um, feel free, there's a questions uh, section in go to webinar. If you ask a question, I will um, answer them for you. Some of them I might just wait until the end, um, but if it's pertinent to what I'm doing at the time, I can answer it then. But feel free to put your questions into um, the little go to webinar panel. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So after you download Docker Desktop, you'll see that you are presented with this screen. Um, and we have a little two minute tutorial here. And basically what this does is basically pulls down uh, some, the source code for the getting started guide, and then gonna build the image. And we're gonna run through what building and running it, everything is. And once we build it, then we're gonna run it. And this will run our, uh, the getting started tutorial in a container for us. And so I'm gonna jump over here to the command line and I'm gonna go ahead and run this uh, command and it's gonna start our getting started tutorial. So now that I have that running, I'll open up in my browser. Okay, so now we have a container running in the background and we have uh, a website that has been pulled up that will, uh, which is our getting started tutorial. So we're gonna just gonna walk down through this and I'm gonna explain everything, hit on some highlights, answer some questions. Um, you can do this same tutorial at home. You can walk through it yourself. Uh, you can walk through it with me um, or you can just watch and then at the end run through it by yourself. So basically what command did we just run? So we ran a, a Docker command and passed it some flags. So here you can see the flags that we passed to the run command. So we passed in a dash D which will run your container in detached mode, which means it basically puts it in the background. And since we're running a web application, um, we, can run it in the, we can run it in the background. If you didn't run it in the background, all the logs will be printed into our terminal. And then we do a, a dash P, which is uh, for exposing ports. And then this 80 colon 80 is how you map ports between your local networking and into the container. And we're gonna, we're gonna address on uh, a little bit of networking later. But um, so dash P colon 80, that first 80 is the port on my local machine, my local network. The colon 80 is the port with inside of the container. In this case, we're using both uh, the same port number outside of the container and inside the container, but you can map different port numbers uh, between the two. And then we tell it what image to start. So Docker forward slash getting started. So Docker is, um, the domain name and then getting started is our report our repository our image okay so this pro tip is just saying you can you can combine single uh, flags with one dash so instead of doing dash d dash p you can also do dash d and p okay so let me take a i'm gonna i'm gonna jump over to docker dashboard real quick and do a kind of a whirlwind tour of it so let's let's skip the tutorial here. And so the first thing you see here on Docker Desktop is we have over on the left, we have containers and we have images. Let's start with images. So what the images tab does is it shows you all the images you have locally, and then you can also connect to a repository. Let's stay local for a second. So this shows me all my images I have locally, what's being used so we can see the docker for slash getting started is in use that's because i've ran that image in the background uh it shows us what tag and image id when it was created different information like that um and then we can also connect into hub so let me put in my okay so now i'm logged into hub and we can see, now I can see all my uh, images and repositories that are located on Hub, I can see them local. And if we drop down here, we can see our different organizations that you belong to. 
and what images are in those um, organization. So we can see here with our different tags. Let's go back real quick here to um, my personal uh, repository. Give that a second to load up. And then you can see here that my vulnerabilities are loading. So if you have a hub account with security scanning uh, included, you'll see the vulnerabilities listed here locally. Um, so it'll tell you the high, the medium, and the low vulnerabilities. And you can also click in the View and Hub tab, and that'll open up this, uh, it'll open a browser window and take you directly to that uh, repository. Okay, so once you start and stop some containers, you'll be able to see them in this containers and apps. So here's our getting started, a Docker forward slash getting started. This is the name of the image. And then this is the name of the container that we have running. So crazy underscore Babbage. This name was just randomly generated because I did not specifically give it a name. But then we can see that it's running and it's running on port 80. And then here we can open up port 80 in a browser. We can connect into the container with a command line. We can stop the container. We can restart it. We can also delete it or remove it. Okay, there's other things you could do in desktop, but right now I don't want to dive too deep into it. I just want to kind of give a high level of where you can find your images and containers. Okay, let's jump back to the tutorial here. So what is a container? So before I kind of describe containers, I want to point out this uh, YouTube video right here. Um, Liz is a Docker captain of ours. She gave a great talk um, at the GoTo um, uh, conference. It's an excellent talk. She actually goes through and shows you how to build containers from scratch using the Linux uh, primitives. It's a, a fantastic talk. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper and understand how uh, file systems are created, how C groups and namespaces namespace underneath the hood are uh, set up, go ahead and take a look at that video. Even if you don't understand 100% of it, um, the little bit you do understand will just keep uh, building on top of your Docker knowledge. So basically a container, is a, an isolated process that's been, uh, it's a normal operating system process, just like you would when you run a command line um, tool, any kind of process on Linux, once you start it, it's the same thing with the container is, but that container, that process is isolated, right? And it uses uh, kernel namespaces and C groups and some other, some other operating system constructs to isolate that process. So that process has its own file system, it has its own permissions, um, it's connected in through networking, those type of things. But at the base of it, it's a simple process, same as an operating system process that's just been isolated. And there's, the, there's this question around what's the difference between virtual machines and containers? That's the biggest difference you have. So virtual machines virtualize the hardware. So when you put a, um, a virtualization layer on top of the hardware, it allows you to install multiple operating systems, and those operating systems believe they have access to all the hardware, memory, all the resources they can see. Containers are uh, containers virtualize the operating system. So containers sit on top of the OS. They need to be OS specific. This is why you can't run a Windows executable container on a Linux machine and vice versa. You can't run a, a Linux executable container on, onto Windows because Windows is not a Linux operating system. Containers share the operating system underneath. But that operating system believes it has the whole uh, OS. It believes it can only see the things that it has access to and it thinks that's the only thing that's there. So those are the, that's the main difference between a virtual machine and containers. And um, a container, again, simply is, uh, a Linux operating system process that's been isolated from the rest of the system. Okay, so what's an image? So an image is basically a template for a running container. So an image is where you can, where you package up all your executable, your binaries that you need, all of its libraries, all of its configuration, the operating system files, everything it needs to run that application is all packaged up in what we call an image. And then you use that image to run containers. So you can think of it a little bit like object-oriented programming between classes and objects. So a class is a template that where you then stamp out objects of that class. Um, another quick analogy in cooking is if you're making uh, cookies and you have a cookie cutter and that is your template and use that cookie cutter to cut out cookies out of the dough. 
Same thing with images and containers. Your image is your template, and then you use that template to create containers, okay? So we're gonna walk through a little application that we're gonna use to demonstrate some of the uh, capabilities of containers and how they work. Uh, our application is a simple to do application. And so let's get that, let's get that set up and running. So I've already downloaded the zip file and I've extracted it. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, the package JSON and the source and everything. So let me come over to my command line and I'll open up Visual Studio Code. Let's make this bigger. Jump up the screen size. So this is just a simple uh, Node.js uh, application. Sorry for the fast scrolling there. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, JavaScript and Node.js and Express, don't worry about it. We're not going to dive too deeply into the code. The point here is to really focus more on um, containers. Okay. So basically, we have our getting, um, sorry, not getting started, but index.js, which is the entry point into the application. Um, we're going to listen on some endpoints. So you can see forward slash items, items ID. So get, post, put, and delete. Uh, this is kind of our back end for our application. Um, then we have some routes, uh, so for when we add an item, delete an item, get items, those type of things. And then we also have some static uh, front end. This is our front end application. Uh, you can see that we're using React. Um, and again, I won't dive too deep into it, but if you want, you could pull this image down, you can grab the source, and you could take a look at it. Okay, so where did it go? There it goes. <laughs> Sorry, forgot what window I had it in. Okay, so um, let's build the containers image. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a file called Docker file. So I'm gonna go back into our code. Let's close these things up and let's create a Docker file. And then in that Docker file, I'm just gonna copy and paste this in here and then I'll explain what this does here. Let me scroll it out a little bit. Okay, now I'm gonna go and put some white space in here in, in between this stuff because I like a little bit of run um, white space. So at the top, so a Docker file again, um, well, so an image is a template for your container. And the way we build an image is we use a Docker file. And basically a Docker file is a list of commands that you would usually run, let's say in your terminal to install your application. So it install your, uh, you first need to install an operating system, you need to install its dependencies for the application you install the application's binaries or you'll pull in their source code, then you'll build the source code, and then eventually you end up running the application. And this is how your images, uh, these commands you put into a file called a Docker file, and these are executed from top to bottom, and the result is your image. So let's walk down through the commands we're running here. So from is a very common um, command that you always start a Docker file, and we have this concept of base images, um, and we have, and so usually you start with a base image. You can start from scratch, is what they call it. You can build an image from scratch, uh, from bare bones, where you're kind of building your own base image. But here we're gonna we're gonna um, start with a already image that has already been built and includes everything we need to run Node applications. So you see from Node, and the reason we only put Node here. It was because Docker understands that that's a, an official image that lives on Hub and knows how to go to Hub and pull that image down. And then we give it a tag, so 12-Alpine. Alpine refers to the Linux distribution, which is a thin, uh, small Linux version uh, distribution, and 12 refers to Node 12. Okay, so we're gonna tell our image is gonna be built from the official Node image. And then, and then here on line three, we're going to set up a working directory, and we're going to call it forward slash app. What a working directory, it's a, it's a little convenience command that tells Docker all the commands that you see after this, unless you give a specific uh, relative or, um, uh, I'm sorry, not a relative, but a fully qualified path, um, assume that you're inside of this working directory. So basically it creates that directory and then CDs into that directory, changes directory into it. So we set up our working directory as app. Now down below, we're gonna copy everything that's local. So that's what this first dot does, is everything that's outside of the image. We're gonna copy all of our files into, inside of the image, 
into the current directory we are in, and that will copy everything into this app directory. And the reason, real quick, is because uh, the reason we're in that current directory is because we did this work directory above it. Okay, so we're going to copy every all the files locally into our local working directory, and then we're going to run a command. So we're going to tell Docker run the command that comes after this run. So we're going to run yarn install production, all right? Just like you would on the on the command line, you would do a run install production that looks at your your package JSON file and installs all its modules that it needs to run. And then we have our last uh, command here, our statement, and that command is command cmd. This is the only command that that is not run when your image is built. This command tells Docker when you go to start an image inside of a container, this is the command I want you to execute. So when our container started, we're basically, this command comes out to node source index.js. Just like we would run on the command line, this is gonna be executed inside the container when it started, okay? So again, real quickly, we start with the base image of node. It's official image that lives on on hub and we're going to include that in our base image so that the node image the uh, official image has everything uh, that you need to run node applications then we set up our working directory then we copy our source code into it and then we run yarn install production to get our node modules installed and then when the image is started in inside of a container we execute node space source index.js and you can see here index uh, source I'm sorry, source forward slash index.js. This is the file that will be executed when our uh, process is, install, is, stall, is started inside of the container. Jeez, I'm having a little hard, hard time talking today, so bear with me. Okay, perfect. So now that we understand what that Docker file is, let's go ahead and build our image. So what we're gonna do, instead of highlighting that, let me just copy that. Come back to my terminal here, let me clear the screen. So let me walk through what we're doing here. So we're gonna run docker build command. So that tells docker, I wanna build an image. And then I give it this dash T. That's telling docker, I wanna tag this image with a name. And I'm gonna give it the tag getting started. And then I'm gonna tell it what context to use. So context is, uh, remember earlier in our docker file when we were copying files right here. So the copy dot, this Docker file is going to get executed within the context that you tell Docker to run in. So we tell Docker run in our local, our local directory we're in. So you can see that we're inside of that local directory and you can see my Docker files right here. So when we do a build, it'll look inside the context. We tell it the directory we're currently in and the default name of your Docker file is just that Docker file. So we can change that. We can, we could call it, um, you know, foobar if we wanted to. And then we would just pass uh, to the Docker build command. We tell it what the name of the Docker file is. But since our Docker file is named Docker file, which is the default, we don't have to specifically tell it what Docker file to use. Okay, so let's run this command. So the Docker build will get getting started um, and the local command. So we run Docker build. We give it a tag of getting started and we tell it the local context is my current directory. That's where my Docker file is located. Once I hit enter here, Docker is going to look for that Docker file in the local directory. It will find it and then it's going to start executing those commands that we have inside of that Docker file. And we can see them right here. So number one, it's going to run and it's going to do this from Docker. And you can see that it's actually pulling this, uh, this the node official uh, image from Docker IO library node. And then it tells you what the SHA is. So this is the actual Docker ID of that image. Not super relevant, but that's what that SHA is doing. And then we come down here to step two. We set up our working directory. We copy our code in. And then we're going to tell it to run install. So now you can see it's um, it ran um, the, the uh, yarn install. If, while I was talking earlier, you probably saw some other commands being shown on the screen here. Then when it's done, it exports our layer, uh, our image, excuse me, and then it's going to name it to getting started. Okay, so let me clear here. And now if we do a Docker images, we can see our image right here, getting started that we just built. 
48 seconds ago, and it's 179 megabytes. Let's jump over to Docker Desktop and take a look at our images. Um, so there it is right there, the same, same images listed in Docker Desktop. Okay. So now I want to take a look at starting our application. So let me let me copy this real quick, and then I'll explain what this command does. Clear my screen. And so to run an image, so now we now we have an image. We created a Docker file. We ran that Docker file, and we produced an image. And now that we have our image, we want to run that image inside of a container. And so we're going to tell it a Docker run, and we're going to pass in dash d dash p. These are the same commands I ran earlier to run the tutorial image. I'm going to run it now um, with our image that we just built. So I say dash d to run it as a daemon, run it in the background, or detached is a prop, more proper way to say it, and give it a dash p. We don't add the extra dash here because we don't need it, but it, we tell it to expose ports, expose port 3000, and map that to port 3000 inside of our container. And then we tell it what image we want you to run. So let me hit that. And so Docker started up the image inside of a container, and then it, it dumped out the container ID to us on the command on the console here. Okay, so now we have um, our image is up and running, so we can go and look at localhost 3000. And we see we have our application is running. Let's add some some to do's. OK. We could put check boxes in those. We can delete them. And then we can add more in. OK, seems to be running OK. Um, let's jump back to our tutorial here. OK. Now let's go and take a look at uh, desktop and show you it running. So we can always we can already see on the images tab. This is our getting started image, and it tells us it's in use. Let's go over in the containers. We already looked at uh, Crazy Babbage. That's our actual tutorial. That's that's this content that's been served up by this image, the getting started. Now we have this uh, other image that's running. You can see it's our image here, getting started. It's running on port 3000, and it also tells us that it's running. Okay. Okay, so one of the biggest things you do with Docker as you're developing is you're running inside of containers, you're updating source code, and you're looking at results. Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to do a little code change, and then I want to show you how we then update our application. So I'm going to copy this. So we're going to go and modify source static JS app.js. So let's go into code. So uh, whoops, source static js app.js and it is on line 56 sorry for the fast scrolling let me make this a little bigger so right here um, if you remember at the beginning when i first started the application you can see no items yet add one above we'll do a new line so we're going to remove um, let me get that little character out of there so It's so hard to see on this, sorry. So we had no items yet. Add one above is what was what was in there before. And we change that to huh. It looks like some, someone updated. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. You have no to-do items yet. Sorry, threw me off for, for a minute. Let's get something more drastic than you have no more. And let's do that, just okay, get rid of that plus. Okay, so now we have, uh, yes, we've updated the code. Okay, so we save that. And then we're, go we're gonna go ahead and start our image again let me go back to um or i'm sorry rebuild our image so i'm going to do i'm going to run that same build command again and you can see you can see here that 
we're running the yarn install and it's installing everything, resolving packages, fe fetching packages, just like you would be running locally when you do an NPM, uh, NPM install or yarn install. Okay, so now we wrote the image and then we labeled it again or named it. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, now we're gonna run our image. Let me clear that. Again, we're gonna to run the image inside of a container. We're gonna run, we're gonna execute the command docker run dash D for a daemon for the background and P for expose our port 3000 map to 3000. And we're gonna call it getting started. I'm gonna hit enter. And of course we get an error. So the reason we're getting an error is that port 3000 has already been allocated. Okay. And what's that is telling us if we do a Docker PS, which tells us uh, processes, the Docker processes that are running. And if we look here underneath the ports column, we can see we already have 3000 mapped to 3000. So when we try and run this uh, image inside of another container and try and map those same ports, this is why we get this error. That port is already allocated, okay? So let's take a look at what we're gonna do. We already did the PS. So we're gonna stop the container, then we're gonna remove it, and then we're gonna run it again, okay? So let's stop our container. Docker start, and you can, get, there's two ways you can stop the container. You can use the image ID, uh, I'm sorry, the container ID, or you can use the name. So I'm gonna tell it the name. Okay, there it stops, so I can do a Docker PS again. We don't see it running. And now we need to remove it. So let me do this. So Docker PS, we can see it's not running, but if you do a Docker PS dash A, we can see that it's still, let me bump this down a little bit. I hope that's still big enough for everybody, but it makes the, um, there we go. Well, okay, good enough. So we did a Docker PS and we only saw this uh, container that's running because it is still running. So you have to do a dash A to show you everything. So there's a couple states that containers are in. They're either running um, or stopped, right? And, but they're not, but they've not been removed yet. So a stop container, you can restart it, okay? And so when we do a Docker PS for processes dash A, we say, show us all the processes, not just the ones that are running. So we can see we have three containers, right? This one has been up for 25 minutes. That's the one that's running our, um, giving us the direct directions for the tutorial in the background. You can see the one just uh, stopped five minutes ago and one about a minute ago, okay, was created. So let's get rid of these. Let's get rid of these two um, images right here. So we're gonna do, let me grab the name. So I'm gonna do a Docker, re oops, remove. Give it a name, I'm gonna give it another space, and I'm gonna give it this one here. And now, if we do a Docker PS-A, we only see the crazy Babbage is running. So if we do Docker PS, that's the only one that's running. And if we come back to our to-do app, it's no longer running, so we get, uh, can't connect, okay? But our content is still running. Uh, I can't see it updates very fast. I'm hitting um, a refresh on there. Let me do it visually. Okay, so this one is still running, but we stopped the other two. Okay, so this is showing how you can do it through the UI. But now let's start our updated container. So let's copy this command. Go back to our console, clear. And so we're gonna do again, the Docker run, dash DP, we're gonna tell it to run it in the background and expose port 3000 and map that to 3000. And then start the getting started image inside of a container. Okay, so now it spits out the image ID to us. We could do a Docker PS. We see we have two running. And now we can go look on um, port 3000 and our app is there. And you can see we have the new uh, updated message that I put into the source code, okay? Oops. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at sharing our application now. So let me grab 
that name. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Docker Hub. I'm going to go to hub.docker.com. I'm going to sign in. If you don't already have a Docker ID, of course, you can create one here for free. So let me sign in. Mine is uh, hopefully I got my my password correct. Okay. So we're going to click on here, and I'm going to go into settings. And I'm going to delete this repository. Delete that. Get rid of that. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to create a repository where we can push our image to. So we'll come up here. I'm just right in the lane, the main landing page for Docker Hub. I can create a repository by clicking this button, or I can go to the repositories in the top menu, and we have the create repository button there also. So I'm going to talk getting started. I'm not going to give it a description. I'm going to keep it public. You can also make it private. And then I'm not going to connect to get or uh, Bitbucket. And then we simply just hit create here. And now I have a repository created for all my images that I want to push. So my repository is key forward slash getting started. Okay. So we created our image. Now we're going to push our image. Right? So let me copy this command to run the push and clear. <laughs> so I'm going to do a Docker push, and I'm going to call it Docker. Sorry, forget, uh, forget my switching there. So we're going to call it Docker push Docker forward slash getting started. I'm going to hit enter. Now I get a request that access to the resource is denied. Authentication is required. Um, I am not part of this Docker forward slash getting started repository. So when I try and push to it, that's why Docker is saying, Hub is saying, oh, no, no, you don't have permissions to push to it. So it won't allow me. I'm going to take, I'm going to list out our images here. And you can see this getting started image is the one we really want to push. Okay. So right now, if I just try to push this image, so if I did Docker push, getting dash started, it's gonna try and push it just up to the, the getting started uh, repository in the root of hub. So you can see Docker IO library, this is the root. And it's saying again, access to this resource is denied. You can't push to the root of hub. So I need to rename this getting started image that I have locally, and I need to name it correctly to my repository that is on Hub. So the name of my repository, I'm going to use a Docker, a Docker tag, and I'm going to do getting started, and I'm going to tag it as p mckee forward slash getting started with a dash. And let's go back in the Hub, and you can see that the name of our repository is p mckee getting started. And you can see here's a Docker command, Docker push key getting started colon with a tag name. Okay. And so with the Docker tag command, this allows me to name images and give them, tag them with other names, right? So I'm going to tag getting started and I'm going to tag it with key forward slash getting started. And I'm not adding a tag here specifically um, at the end. If you leave off the colon, and no tag, it will default to latest. And I'm going to show you that here in a second, as soon as I run this command. So I ran that command. Now let me list my images. This gives me a list of all my images. So we still have the getting started. And then we can see the new image that I've tagged, Pima key forward slash getting started. And you can see I didn't give it a, a tag, a colon tag extension here. So it automatically tagged it as latest. Okay. Now an interesting, you should a uh, couple of things of note here is you can see the image ID are the same. That's because they're the exact same image. It's just a different name or a different tag for that image. Okay, but under Lee, underneath, think of it as a, a pointer. So we have a, um, a tag as a pointer to a specific image. And you can have multiple tags that point to a specific image. 
Okay, so now that I have it named correctly, now I can push it up. So I'm gonna do a Docker push, Pima key forward slash getting started. Okay, now it's pushing. And you can see we're uploading files, pushing all the layers up to Hub. We'll give that a second. Okay, so that's been pushed. Let me refresh the page here. Give it a second while well, it spins and grabs the, all of our tags. So now we can see where we didn't have anything here before, we can see now we have latest, the image we just pushed up. And you can see pushed a few seconds ago. We can click on that image and go and look at the details. We can see what commands have been run to build our image. And oh, sorry, we can also take a look at vulnerabilities. I do not have um, scanning set up yet, and I'm not going to do that here. But if we did have uh, scanning set up, you would able to, you would be able to see all your vulnerabilities. Once you push an image in the hub, if scanning is turned on, it'll automatically scan that and show you the vols. Okay, let's jump back in. So. Oh, so this is what we did. I just walked through. We tagged our image, and then we pushed our image. So now let's open our image in a different environment, right? We had we we first created a Docker file. We added our commands. We ran that Docker file that produced an image for us, and then we ran ran that image inside of a container. We connected to it, interacted with the application. We went and made a change to the application. We rebuilt our image, and then ran it again and we saw those changes and then we said okay well now we need to share this out with the team so we tagged it to the correct docker hub repository and then we just pushed that image into hub now i could go to a friend or a colleague or someone in a product that needs to take a look at the work i've done and i could say hey i've built a new image and i've pushed it to hub go ahead and pull that down and run it okay so that's what we're going to simulate here so I'm going to open Play with Docker in a browser window, another window. So what Play with Docker is, it's a, an environment that has Docker installed up in the cloud. And it gives you a way that you could play around with uh, your different images and have multiple instances. So I'm going to create another, create a instance here. So there we go. Um, and you can see we have Docker install. So let's clear, let's clear that out. Sorry, wrong tab. Okay, so now that we're up on um, Play with Docker, I'm gonna run the same command that we've been running to run our image. So I'm gonna copy that. And instead of user dash username, I need to add my name in there, which is P McKee. Now this is the same name that we just tagged locally, right? So let me go look locally, clear our screen, Docker images. We can see I have P McKee forward slash getting started, right? And we have P McKee forward slash getting started. So we're gonna run that same Docker run command we've been using, but now we're up in the cloud and play with Docker and not local. It's so also too, let me show you that. So Docker image, whoops. Docker images. So we don't have any images locally here, right? So when we run, What's going to happen is Docker's going to go, we're going to look and say, oh, I don't have that image. Let me go up to Hub. Let me see if they have it. They have it. Let me pull that image down and then let me run that image. And we're going to run it the same way. We're going to run it in the background and we're going to expose port 3000. Okay. Oops. What did I do wrong? Oh, that's because I forgot to update the name here. So P McKee, enter. See that? Unable to find the image. Let's go get it. Pull in latest pulling it down, extracting it. And now it started. And here's our Docker image. So Docker PS, we can run the same commands here. We can see, yep, we have our image running. It's running on port 3000. Okay. And then what's really cool about uh, Play With Docker is if you expose a port, Play With Docker recognizes that and it gives you links up here. So if we click on this little link, that'll open up um, a routing into our container. And so you can see I didn't put 
port 3000 here, that's because uh, Play With Docker does some magic and redirects everything into your image from port 8, port 80 coming from the internets. And so we can add some items. We can check them off and we can delete them. All right, excellent. So recap real quick is um, we built our image and we tagged it locally. We gave it a, and tagging makes, uh, gives you another name for your image. So we tagged it and we added my hub repository name on there. So pmckee forward slash getting started. And then we pushed that image up to hub so we could share it with others. And then we went into a different environment into play with Docker, which is running in the cloud. We were able to pull that image down and then run it locally. Okay. So let's talk about persisting data. So the containers file system, containers are, are immutable, right? And what that means is they're unchangeable, right? And we have this layered file system where each command within a Docker file creates a layer that sits on top of each other. And when you write to a file, it doesn't overwrite that file in that layer, it creates another layer on top of that and adds that file, the new uh, edited written to file on top of it, right? And then when that container is stopped and removed, that temporary scratch layer goes away. And all the changes you made while that file is running disappear. They go away. They're not pers they're not persisted. So they become our containers become truly stateless, right? But there are times where where we want to persist data, right? And to persist data, you need to use a file system, obviously, or a database. Um, and usually, a file system is underlying a database. So that's what we're going to kind of walk through here. So let's let's. Uh, start uh, let's demonstrate this uh read only layer right so i'm going to start a uh, ubuntu container and we'll create a file called data.txt and we're going to add random numbers to it okay so let me copy this command clear okay so i'm going to do a docker run dash d in the background i'm going to use the ubuntu image right and then i'm going to tell everything after this image this will all get passed into the image as the command. It will overwrite that command that we had in our Docker file. So if we pass in a command here, let's demonstrate that real quick uh, before we run this. Let me jump over here so it's clear. Um, so if I did uh, docker run dash D um, and getting dash started, and I'm going to call, I'm just going to run node. I'm going to pass in the node command. Right? So if I do that, whoop, not that, well, helps not. Uh, this is what happens when you try and go off script a little bit. <laughs> Please do, let's say stop. And oh, let me show you a shortcut. So before we did a stop, and then we did a remove. Well, you can short, you could shortcut that by doing a uh, remove with a dash F to force it. If you try and remove a running container, it'll say it's still running. You can't remove it yet. Please stop it first. But to stop and remove, you can do an RM for remove dash F to force. So I'm going to say uh, remove and force it. So I'm going to nervous Herschel. Okay. So Docker PS, it's gone. Okay, so let's run our Docker run again. I'm not going to put it in the background so I can show you what happens when we override the command. So I'm going to say Docker run. I'm going to give it a dash IT, which is an interactive terminal. So we can actually type into the command, into the uh, container. I'm going to, and it is getting started. Oh, no, getting started and pass it in node. Okay. So normally when we started our getting started before, it started up our web application, right? And that's because we had this command in our Docker file. Remember, from uh, 20 minutes ago or so, when I said when you run, um, when you put these commands in here, one of the commands that it's executed when you run the container is this command, the CMD, right? But since we passed in a command to our, our uh, container, we said, don't run this one. I want you to override that and take what I've passed into you and run that and execute that instead. So you can see that here, we passed in node, right? And what that did is started up the interactive uh, node terminal, 
right? And so we can we can run, um, you know, console log hello. Um, we can run JavaScript commands from here, and then to get out of that, do a command D. That ended our uh, stopped our container. Dash A. So you can see we we still have two of them still running. So let's so Docker remove and okay Docker ps dash day dash a there we go we only still have our uh, tutorial running in the background oh sorry let me go back here so this is what we're going to do here so we're going to pass into the Ubuntu image we're going to tell it run bash dash c um, and we're going to run this command it's easier to see if I put it back over here there it is right there so we're going to do the same docker run run it as a daemon we're going to run this is the image that we're going to use and we're going to run override the command that's in that image with this command and this is just a bash shell script it's going to get random numbers one the 10,000 grab one of them output it in the data.txt and then we're going to tail it into devnull and so if we run that it can't find the Ubuntu latest image, so it goes and pulls it down, and now it's running. It's running in the background. So if we do a Docker PS, we can see it's running here, and you can see the command that was run, right? Up five seconds ago, it's running away. Okay, so now to, to validate the output, uh, a couple of ways you can do that. So, so what, what it's going to do here is it won't, Let's jump over to Docker in the desktop. So we can see our Ubuntu image. It's running, no ports and it's uh, being exposed, right? Because we didn't expose a port. But we can actually click on this CLI button here and that'll open up your terminal and we'll execute inside of the container. So let's make that nice and big for us. And it's clear. So you can see I'm inside of my container. I have lib boot data.txt. This is the file that we're gonna look at here in a second, but this looks very familiar to an operating system, right? And let's do my PWD, it tells me my working directory, print working directory. So it tells me I'm in my I'm in the root working directory and we have this data.txt. Let's see if I have that locally. So let's cd into the Let's cd into the root, and then we'll do an ls-l, and you can see in my root, I have a lot of this Mac stuff. So I have applications, library, system, users, vols, and we don't see the data file, right, that we see here, data.txt. So you can see when you're inside of an image, it's isolated and has its own files, right? We don't see our applications, library, system, users, volumes. I'm not seeing that inside this container. Okay, I um, believe it wants to cat out. Yeah, so we're gonna cat out this um, text file inside of our container. And as, uh, um, and we have the, the number been printed out to it, right? Um, you can also do this docker, docker exec, right? Which will exec into the running container. So let's do that real quick. So I'm going to close this terminal. Yep, terminate. Let me run back desktop. So what I did here is click the CLI. Uh, desktop does some magic that opens up, opens up a terminal, basically does a Docker execute, executes you inside of that container, and then gives you back that uh, command line inside of that container. We can do the same thing from locally manually. So we're gonna, um, oh, we need to get the name of the image that's running. So it's confident Schwartz. So we're gonna do a Docker whoop, exec, give it the name of the container, and then um, we're gonna give it a, uh, we're gonna tell it to cat out the data.txt. And there we go, we get the 5113, right? We can also just do bash. 
So execute, so run Docker, execute, execute a command inside the container. And since I'm running bash, I'm gonna give it the, I need to give it the interactive terminal so I can type commands into it. So let me run that. So now I'm inside of the, um, inside of that container again, right? There's my data.txt. Again, you don't see any applications, user volumes, those type of things. All right, and then let's just exit out of there. Perfect. Okay, and then we saw our random number. Here it's showing you how to um, to run other commands like I just did. So you'll see the IT here, which is the interactive terminal. So we are able to type commands in, and then it gave it the name of the image in Ubuntu, and then said run an ls forward slash. Okay. Um, so let's remove our container real quick here. So Docker um, ps. So Docker um, move dash f. And like I said before, you can you can um, anytime you're running commands against a container, you can give it the name or you can give it the container ID. So I'm going to give it the container ID this time. And there we go. And we did the rm dash f again. That's a shortcut for a Docker stop and then a Docker remove. If you run a um, again, if you run Docker remove without first stopping your container, you'll get an error and say, hey, you need to first stop the container then remove it. So with an rm-f, it combines those two. It stops your container and then removes it. So if we do a docker ps, we don't see it there. If we do docker psa, show us everything, we don't see it there. Okay, cool. So that's one way uh, to persist. And we're persisting that data into our container. But once that container stopped, that data is gone. It doesn't persist past stopping and starting uh, containers. So we're gonna now we're gonna take a look at volumes, which is a way to persist data between starting and stopping. Okay, and so our to do app uses a SQLite database. It stores its data in Etsy to dos to do dot db. Right now that is being written into that scratch layer. So when the, the container stops, that scratch layer goes away, and obviously we'll lose all of our data that we save to the database. So what we want to use is a volume. And what a volume does is it it allows Docker to manage data and map that between its local system that Docker is managing and the file system that's inside of the container. That way, anything you write to that um, container can be stored into a volume that's outside of that container, which is independent of the starting and stopping a container. So you can write into a volume, uh, you could start an image and connect to a volume and then write into that volume, stop that container and that volume persists you can start a different uh, image inside of a container and map it into that volume. And then you can read that data out of the volume or save that data or save data into that volume. And that if you write into the volume, it'll it'll be persistent across starts and stops. So let's go ahead and create a create a volume. So we can see uh, these are old volumes that I've had around. So let's we can actually remove them. Uh, volume remove. I'm going to do these all at once. Okay. Docker uh, volume ls. There we go. Okay. So now, well, uh, next. Let me copy this and I'll type it all back out. Okay, so we're gonna run a Docker volume and then we're gonna do a create. So we're gonna create a volume, we're gonna call it to-do-db. Okay, so Docker volume ls, and there we go. We have our local uh, driver type is local and the volume name is to-do. We can Docker volume inspect uh, to-do-db. That'll tell us some details about this volume when it was created, type of driver, we didn't create any labels, but you can add labels to it. And that gives you a, a mount point, so var lib docker volumes to do so underscore data. Now, if we try and cd into that var li, whoop, lib docker, uh-oh, we don't have a docker. So no file directory found. That's because this mount point, when you run docker desktop, if you remember at the very beginning, um, Containers need images need to run in containers that are for that 
specific operating system. And so since I'm running Mac OS, I'm not running Linux, right? Um, Mac OS is actually based on BSD. It's a Unix type system, but it, it's not Linux. So what desktop does is actually creates a VM underneath the uh, a very, very thin, thin VM underneath the, uh, the scenes, and it wires everything up for you. So it wires up the Docker CLI to the engine that's running inside the VM, which is a Linux VM. So this mount point is actually inside of the VM, right? And that's why we can't see it locally. Um, and then we can see the name is todo-db. Uh, we don't have any options. Scope is local. All right. Um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and remove, let's stop. I think we've stopped it already. Let's see. That's not local. Here it is local. Yeah. So we're stopped already. So I don't need to run that. Sorry. Um, now let's restart our app and now we're going to connect, connect that volume that we just created inside of our running container so we can persist data. So I just copy that command. Clear the screen. So again, we're going to do a Docker run, dash DP, you should be familiar with that. Now we're going to give it a dash V, which stands for volume. We're going to give it the name of the volume we created earlier. And then we're going to do a colon, forward slash Etsy, forward slash to do's. This is very similar to how we did the port mappings. So locally, we tell it dash V for volumes. And we say locally, take the to do DB volume that we created and map that to this mount point inside the container, Etsy to do's, right? So now inside, anytime inside of the container, if anything is written to Etsy to do's, that's actually mapped into our volume and we're, will persist, right? So, and then we tell it the name of the um, image we want to run and we say, go ahead and run. So let's do a Docker PS. We can see our image getting started. And it's the friendly Babbage mapped port 3000 and we're up and running three seconds ago and now let's open up our app and we can see oops sorry so let's go here uh, we can leave that okay now we're running let's make some really cool items this is like my kids to do list uh, so let's check that, delete that. Everything is functioning properly. And you can see everything is being persisted. And now what we're going to do is we're going to grab the ID of it and then we're going to remove the image, right? We're going to stop it. And then, um, then we're going to start the, uh, a new container and see that our uh, to do should show up. Okay. So you notice how before um, when we start, we don't have a, a picture there. But when we start the image without the volume persisted, persistent data, that every time we start and stop the image, we've lost all of our to-dos, right? Start and stop the container, excuse me. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop it. So it's friendly bad image. So docker rm-f, I'm gonna use the shortcut. I'm gonna tell it friendly babbage, docker ps, it's gone. Docker psa, it's gone, right? And let's clear and let's do Docker, oh wow, go away, go, go away, go away. I had, oh great, um, do not disturb until this evening. Okay, so um, Docker run, I'm gonna give it the same command. Let's leave off the to-do right now. So we started it, our items didn't show up. So Docker PS, let's go Docker remove dash F and modest. Okay. So it's gone. Let's start it back up. There we go. And now I'm gonna map the volume in again. So let's map the volume. Now let's refresh and there we go. Our items have been persisted. They've been saved into that volume. Since I attached the volume to the container, we can see that data. All right. So we already took a look at Docker uh, volume inspect. Um, we've also talked about the mount point. So great. 
So that's how we um, you persist data using volumes. Another way to do that is to use bind mounts. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to go really fast through this. Um, but basically, what we can do is instead of using a volume in this scenario, so when we went to Docker run, we use the volume. Instead of doing that, we can map locally. So let's let's cd into my home directory here, and I'm going to make a directory. I'm going to call it uh, temp. Uh, I was going to say temp test. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, let's just do temp test. And now we're going to do a Docker run. Right? Instead of giving it a named volume. We're going to tell it to do our current working directory forward slash temp test. Okay. And so that'll give my passing the this with the dollar sign will be executed first. And the result that comes out of there will be my working directory, which is my home directory. And then that'll be a concatenated with this temp dash test. Right. So that'll map that'll map my local home directory, temp dash test, into the container on Etsy to do's. Okay. Let's go. Oh, port's already out. Yeah, Docker PS. Ah. Let's move both of these. Okay. So Docker run. And again, I'm going to run that. I'm mapping in my uh, working directory attempt dash test into Etsy to do's. Okay, now let's open up our application. We don't have anything saved yet. So one, two, three, okay. Let's check that one. Let's come back, let's get Docker. So let's stop and remove this container. Docker remove dash F. Okay, Docker PS dash A, it is gone. Um, whoops, let's cd into temp test clear. And you can see we have a, our to do DB has been written down to our local file system. And now let's run again. And I'm, again, I'm going to map in my local file system, this folder into Etsy to do's. So let's map that. Now, if we come back to our application, um, let me go, let me make this error out here first and then to show you, because I think the refresh will happen too quickly to see. So now we run up oh, and our data was not mapped in. What? Of course, of course, when I try and do this on the fly, it's not going to work for me. Uh, Docker inspect getting, whoops, angry. The networks, ports. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what it did. Docker, uh, let me clear. Docker ps dash a. Docker remove dash f. And it's angry. Shocking. Okay, what happened was I'm in. I'm. I forgot I seed in cd'd into this directory so when i ran the docker run this print working directory so if i do a pwd right i i'm going to get temp dash test and then if i append append temp dash test it's going to it's not the correct directory so let me cd up one and now we can do our docker run 3000 map that in now let me refresh okay there we go our data has been persisted Awesome. Okay. So this this is what basically is going to walk you through with using bind mounts, um, but it's also going to kind of set you up a little bit local dev envir environment. So I would highly uh, recommend that you guys uh, come back and run run through this. Right. Um, real quick, I want to show you logging.
I'm going to copy this so I can show you logging. So let me clear here. Um, actually, let's go um, cd into sandbox app. OK, now I can run this command. So I'm going to do a Docker run, dash DP. You're familiar with that, mapping port 3000 in the, in the uh, 3000 in the container. I'm going to set up my working directory, which is forge to last app. So inside the container, it's going to move me into forge slash app. I'm going to create a volume and I'm going to do the same thing I was doing before. I'm going to run PWD colon in the app. So I'm going to map my local working directory, which right now is sandbox app where all my source code lives. And then after you do that, I want you to run the node image, the node official image 12 dash alpine tag. And then instead of running the uh, the command that they had in their Docker file, we're going to overwrite that with a shell command. And we're going to tell it run yarn install and then run yarn run dev. Right? So it's going to pull the image down for us and I already have port 3000. Um, I forget to stop these and remove them all the time. Sorry. Let's move that guy and then. Okay. Run that again. And now what that did is it's going to run my container, but we're not seeing NPM or I'm sorry, yarn install being run because we ran this in the background. So there's another Docker command called Docker logs. So we're going to do Docker logs. And let's actually get the name of the uh, container. So great Moser. So we can do a Docker logs and give it the name of the container and that will print out the logs for us. So there we go. Now we can see the logs. This is what actually was happening inside of our container when we started it up and ran yarn install, right? Resolve packages, fetch them, and basically executed our yarn install. We walked through what each of these commands are doing, and then we ran our um, logs to see the logs. And now that it's running, let's make sure it's running though. Let's go over into the to-do. Um, let's go one. So we save that. And um, we're going to change line 109. Let me copy this. So let's go into the source code and into app.js line, oops, sorry, 109 right here. So right now you can see it says add item. So this says add item. We're going to change it to just say add. So I'm going to delete this and get rid of the X here so it doesn't. Okay, so I saved that. And now when I refresh, our add item has changed the add. I didn't need to rebuild my image. My image. I didn't need to stop the container, rebuild the image, and then start a container. I just was changing source code. And the reason it was able to update inside of this container is because I mapped the source files inside of the container. And um, because we started the command, we overrode the command with yarn install and then yarn run dev. That ran the process inside of that container was the dev process, right? So that development server that uh, folks are familiar with. So when files change on the file system, everything is updated and, and your app is refreshed. And so we can go in and we can change this to, let's say more, let me save that, come over here and refresh, and now we have a more, right? So I'm just coding, I'm changing code locally on my machine and then we're seeing the updates inside of the container, right? Awesome. Okay. So I, this is a this is a great place to stop. This this um, this tutorial is a, a little bit long, but we'd like to get you through the the first half of it. Um, please, I want to. I want to try and address some questions that I see real quick before we um, before we end here. And we're a little bit over time, so forgive me. But please go download Docker Desktop, click the whale, go to the Get Started Guide, follow these 
quick four steps. You can actually, um, if you don't have a Docker ID and you don't want to share it, you can skip that step, just run it locally, run the, um, and run the tutorial and walk through the exact same tutorial that we've been walking through. And you can get to using Mark the Container apps and Compose. Awesome. Well, let me take a look. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to take a look at the questions and see if I can answer some questions. And give me a minute, please. Okay. Do you need to give container ID in full when running Docker RM? No. You can you can give uh, Eddie. You can give the um, a sufficient amount of digits that makes it unique. <laughs> um, so there's not a let me. Um, so when you do a Docker um, PS and you see the container ID, it doesn't even list out all of the digits in that container ID. So as long as you grab the first couple three or four digits and they're unique across the container IDs, it'll it can figure out which one it is. If your containers are each of the container ID starts with A, um, and then the next letter is a number and it goes A1, A2, A3, A4, uh, you would have to give it two two digits. So A1 to identify that container uniquely. Right? Hopefully that makes sense. But usually it's uh, two or three digits but you do not have to type out the full container ID. Um, okay, was only Etsy to do, was only forward slash Etsy forward slash to do as a directory mounted and SQLite saving there, or were all FS changes saved? Only things that were mapped, only things that were written to Etsy to do were mapped into the volume. Everything else that was written to any other place on the file system will be lost. They're written to the read only, to the scratch layer. And then when that container stop, that scratch layer goes away. Only the things in our scenario that was written to Etsy to do. Okay. Um, can you use a dot instead of dollar PWD, Charles? You can in your compose file on the command line, it does not like the dot. Okay. Is there any possibility that Docker mounts on Mac OS will be as quick as, um, I think it says, uh, us on Linux? Um, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're moving there. Um, it's not, obviously, not as quick as on Linux, um, but it's getting pretty darn quick. Hopefully, with the, um, you know, the new uh, M1 chips that are coming out, mine is actually, I think I heard the doorbell while I was giving this presentation. Do I believe my M1? Uh, MacBook Pro is here, and not Pro, but just MacBook. Um, but anyways, I'm gonna go take a look at it. But no, um, just because you, uh, just because of the constructs that we have to use between running a VM and a local file system, there's a tiny bit of delay. But we're trying to get that down as as unnoticeable as possible. For most scenarios that people are doing, it's not a big issue. If you're updating a lot of files in and out, uh, mapping those through, uh, then you might see a little bit of performance hit, but not much. Um, if if that becomes an issue, your best your best uh, bet is to run um, either a full blown Linux VM on your Mac and work inside of that uh, VM, or running you know booting dual booting up into a Linux distro. Um, but on that, it really really runs pretty quickly, and the the team has made some significant changes and improvements. Uh, as a quick shout out, if that's something you're interested, join our uh, desktop preview program. And in there, you'll get uh, previews to desktop with file system changes that we're doing, uh, speed improvements, all kinds of new features. Um, but we're really looking for folks to give us feedback, right? So if, if um, I'm gonna try and pronounce your name, please forgive me, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong. Const Constantin, um, if you wanna join in there or ping me on the, on the Docker Slack channel, I'll get you put into the, the preview program. Um, well, we'd love all, all the eyes that we can get on it. It'd be very helpful. Can you tell us about Docker Compose in 60 seconds? Yeah, Docker Compose is a way to, to uh, manage multiple containers locally. Um, and then you can also uh, run those containers just like you would locally, you could, but you can run them in the cloud. So we have integration between Compose files and the Docker CLI with 
Amazon and Azure, Amazon ECS, Elastic Container Service, and Azure ACS, um, which is Azure Container Service. Um, and so you can run your Compose files exactly as you do locally, and you can run them in the cloud. But a Compose file is, as we were writing out all these commands on the command line, you can actually take those commands and using YAML, put those into a structured format, and so you don't have to retype them. And you also get some uh, networking benefits. So when you run everything in a Compose file, if you have multiple containers in there, when that Compose application is started, those, those containers are started together and they're put on the same network so they're able to see each other and reach each other. Um, okay. Let's see here. Is it possible to force the user to mount a persistent storage before starting a container? Uh, there's no way to have, um, let's say, in, in like in your Docker file to force someone to mount something. Um, they can always overwrite your mounts. They can always set up their own mounts. Um, they can always persist to somewhere else. Uh, so if I understand your question, your question, it, it's there's no way to uh, ensure that consistently. Um, there's some best practices though. Uh, you got an M1. Yes, Constantin, Constantin, Constantin. Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Um, yeah, if you have an M1 and you're looking at Mac file speeds, join, join. if you're not already in there, join, join the uh, desktop preview for sure. Uh, you're already preview, okay, cool. Okay, we have one more here. So what's the difference between uh, Docker Compose and Docker Networks? Um, so Docker Compose does a lot more than just Docker Networks. So like I was just saying earlier, you can have multiple containers um, inside of, a, inside of a, um, a Docker Compose file and then run those with one command. And those will automatically be put on the same network. You can do that outside of it. So you can create a Docker network. You can start a container and attach it to that network. You can start a second container and attach it to that same network. And now those two containers are able to see each other on the same network and have DNS, have lookup, service lookup. Um, you just have to do it manually. With Compose files, it'll do that automatically for you. <laughs> I want to be an expert in Docker. What should I do? Do I need a mentor? Uh, mentors are always, always very helpful. Um, I would say this. I always give three. There's three levels of advice that I always give to, to people who want to um, become experts or learn new technology. Um, number one is have a desire, burn desire. You obviously do. You're sitting on our um, webinar. You're learning about it. So that's great. That's number one, right? Number two is uh, to practice, to use the technology. So I always tell uh, potential engineers that want to become software engineers, you need to code. You need to code a lot. You need to write a lot of bad code, read code, code. If you're playing a sport or a musical instrument or cooking or doing anything, a skill that you want to get better at, you need to practice, right? Even professional uh, football players around the world, they practice, right? They dribble the ball, they shoot goals, they practice in every day. Even when they're playing at the top 1% in the world, they're still practicing. So um, have a burning desire, practice every day. And the third thing is find a mentor. If you can find a mentor, they're able to help accelerate your learning, 10X your learning, right? Because they could show you what areas to focus on and when to focus on them. They can, they've walked the road before you and they know where the potholes are. They know where the dragons be, as they say and they can tell you how to, to watch out for the dragons, so to speak. Um, but yes, I believe in mentors 100%. Awesome, well, please forgive me. I know we ran over. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, look for a follow-up email from this. This has been recorded and will be sent out to you. And again, thanks so much for joining. I really, really appreciate it. And you have a great rest of your week. Take care, everybody.